Chapter 3 The Flight of the Fugitives Another Spoiler Tip reflected. It is a hard thing to be a marble statue. Is it? I would imagine it's just kind of like not existing. It is a hard thing to be a marble statue, he thought rebelliously. And I'm not going to stand for it. For years I've been a bother to her, she says, so she's going to get rid of me. Well, there's an easier way for me to be a statue. No boy could have fun forever sitting in the middle of a flower garden. I'll run away, that's what I'll do. Oh, and I may as well go before she makes me drink that nasty stuff in the kettle. He waited until the snores of the old witch announced she was fast asleep. And then he rose softly and went to the cupboard to find something to eat. That was a snore that was well worth listening to. No use starting on a journey without food, he decided, searching upon the narrow shelves. Ah, I, I do agree. He found some crusts of bread, but he had to look into Mombai's basket to find the cheese that she brought from the village. While turning over the contents of the basket, he came upon a pepper box, which contained the powder of life. I may as well take this, he thought, or Mumbai will be using it to make more mischief with. So he put the box in his pocket, together with the bread and cheese. Then he cautiously left his house and latched the door behind him. Outside, both the moon and the stars shone brightly, and the night seemed peaceful and inviting after the close and ill-smelling kitchen. Mm. I'll be glad to get away, said Tip softly, for I never did like that old woman. I wonder how I ever came to live with her. He was walking slowly toward the road when the thought made him pause. I don't like to leave Jack Pumpkinhead to the mercies of the old Mumbai he muttered. And Jack belongs to me, for I made him. Even if the old witch did bring him to life, he retraced his steps to the cow stable and opened the door in the stall where the pumpkin-headed man had been left. Jack was standing in the middle of a stall, and by the moonlight, Tip could see he was smiling just as jovially as ever. Come on, said the boy, beckoning. Where to? asked Jack. You'll know as soon as I do, answered Tip, smiling sympathetically into the pumpkin face. All we've got to do now is to tramp. Very well, returned Jack, and walked awkwardly out of the stable and into the moonlight. Tip turned toward the road, and the man followed with him. Jack walked with sort of a limp, and on occasion one of his joints and legs would turn backwards instead of frontwise, almost causing him to stumble. But the pumpkin head was quick to notice this, and began to take pains to step carefully so that he was met with few accidents. Which is excellent. And, if you'll recall, much better than that scarecrow. Tip led him along the path without stopping an instant. They could not go very fast, but he walked steadily, and by the time the moon sank away and the sun peeped over the hills, they had traveled so great a distance that the boy had no reason to fear the pursuit from the old witch. Moreover, he had turned first into one path, then to another, so that should anyone follow them, it would prove very difficult to guess which way they had gone, or where to seek them. Fairly satisfied that he had escaped, for a time at least, being turned into a marble statue, the boy stopped his companion and seated himself along the rock by the roadside. Let's have some breakfast, he said. Jack Pumpkinhead watched Tip curiously, but refused to join in the repast. Uh, repast means a meal. I don't seem to be made the way you are, he said. Who I know it or not, returned Tip, for I made you. Oh, you did, asked Jack. Certainly, and put you together and carved your eyes and your nose and your ears and your mouth, said Tip proudly, and dressed you. Jack looked at his body and his limbs critically. It strikes me you made a very good job of it, he remarked. Just so-so, replied Tip modestly. <laughs> oh, that's kind of an insult for he began to see certain defects in the construction of the man. If I'd known we were going to travel together, I might have been a little more particular. Why then, 
said the pumpkin head, in a tone that expressed surprise. You must be my creator, my parent, my father. Yes, my son, I really believe I am. Then I owe you my allegiance, continued the man, and you owe me support. That's it exactly, declared Tip, jumping up. So let us be off. What city is that? inquired the pumpkin head. Why, it's the land of Oz. I have never been there myself, but I've heard all about its history. It was built by a mighty and wonderful lizard named Oz, and everything there is of a green color, just as everything in this country of the country of the Glickens is of a purple color. Is everything here purple? asked Jack. Who, oh, of course it is. Can't you see? returned the boy. I believe I must be color blind, said the pumpkin head. After staring about him, well, the grass is purple and the trees are purple and and the houses and fences are purple, explained to Tip. Even the mud in the roads is purple, but in the Emerald City everything is green that is purple here, and in the country of the Munchkins over in the east everything is blue, and in the south country of the Quadlings everything is red, and in the west country of the Winkies, <laughs> the Winkies. Where the Teen Woodman rules, everything is yellow. Oh, said Jack. Then after a pause he said, Did you say a Teen Woodman rules the Winkies? Yeah. Yes, he did. Yes, he was the one who helped Dorothy to destroy the Wicked Witch of the West. And the Winkies were so grateful that they invited him to become their ruler. Just as the people of the Emerald City invited the Scarecrow to rule them. Dear me, said Jack, I am getting confused with all this history. Who is the Scarecrow? Another friend of Dorothy's, replied Tip. And who is Dorothy? She was a girl that came here from Kansas, a place in a big outside world. She got blown to the city of Oz by a cyclone, and... While she was here, the Scarecrow and the Teen Woodman accompanied her on her travels. And where is she now? inquired the pumpkin head. Glinda the Good, who rules the Quadlings. The Quadling? The, the Quadlings, I mean to say. Glinda the Good, who rules the Quadlings, sent her home again, said the boy. Oh, oh and what became of the Scarecrow? I told you, he rules the Emerald City answered Tip. I thought you said it was ruled by a wonderful lizard, objected Jack, seemingly more and more confused. I mean, to be honest, I'm confused about the lizard as well. Well, so did I. Now, pay attention and I'll explain it, said Tip, speaking slowly and looking at the smiling pumpkin head squarely in the eye. Dorothy went to the Emerald City to ask the lizard to send her back to Kansas, and the Scarecrow and the Teen Woodman went with her. But the Lizard couldn't send her back because, well, he wasn't so much of a lizard as he might have been. And they got angry at the Lizard and threatened to expose him. So the Lizard made a big balloon and escaped in it, and no one has ever seen him since. Now that is a very interesting history, said Jack, well pleased. And I understand it perfectly, all but the explanation. Uh, he should listen to The Wonderful Lizard of Oz, and that would really catch him up. I'm glad you do, responded Tip. After the lizard was gone, the people of the Emerald City made His Majesty the Scarecrow their king, and I've heard that he has become a very popular ruler. Are we going to see this queer king? asked Jack with interest. I think we may as well, replied the boy, unless you have something to do better. I, I have something better to do. Oh no, dear father, said the pumpkin head. I am quite willing to go wherever you please. Uh.